two. Well, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Professor David Lurcher um, from the School of Information in San Jose State University. And I'm absolutely delighted today to talk to uh, Dr. Robert uh, um, Brian Johnson from uh, Arkansas, where I spent 10 years as a professor at the University of Arkansas. So introduce yourself and tell us about your school. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Lurcher. And, and thanks so much for the opportunity to just talk about inquiry and some of the wonderful work that's going on in libraries in Arkansas. Um, as Dr. Lurcher mentioned, my name is Dr. Brian Johnson, and I'm the library media specialist at Lakeside Junior High School in Springdale, Arkansas. We're located in kind of a growing small metropolitan area in Northwest Arkansas, really close to the University of Arkansas where Dr. Lurcher used to teach. Um, a little bit about Lakeside. Lakeside is a very culturally diverse school. We have about a third of our population is Hispanic. A third of our population is Marshall Islanders. We have the largest population of Marshall Islanders in the United States outside of the Marshall Islands wow. um, that attend schools in Springdale in this community. And then we're about 30% Caucasian, and then we're about 5% African American. We're also about 85% free reduced lunch. So we're in a high poverty setting over on the east side of Springdale, Arkansas. Wow. So um, very diverse community. So I understand that your passion is uh, inquiry, uh, co-teaching and technology. Uh, tell us uh, about that. What is it? And, and give us some examples. Okay, sure. I'd be glad to. Um, sometimes when people ask me about my title, they say, oh, you're a librarian. I would say that my title is really teacher in really, really large letters and librarian in smaller letters, because really I am a teacher, although I have a different title now. Um, I am all about instruction and supporting my teachers. And also, as you mentioned, I love to co-teach and collaborate. That's probably my favorite thing about serving as a library media specialist. Wow. Um, and part of where, where that comes from is I was a classroom teacher for about 15 years. I taught mostly sixth and seventh and eighth grade and a little bit of high school. And I've taught every subject except for science. So I love <laughs> instruction. And just in terms of my instructional approach, um, I love to infuse technology and I work with a really fantastic team of teachers too. We, we tend to stop saying we've been, we've been open for about 10 years at Lakeside and I've been here since we started. And in the beginning, they used to come in and say, Hey, Brian, can we, cause they had an idea that they wanted to work with and develop into some, some instruction. And, and we've kind of evolved to now we say not, can we, but how can we, how can we accomplish these crazy, incredible inquiry based learning opportunities for our, our learners that, you know, some people say that there's a box or some people talk about being an in the box person or an out of the box person. My instructional approach is I didn't even know there was a box. Um, I'm very much an out of the box thinker. Um, and we tend to think about, you know, how can we make this happen for our, for our learners, for all of our learners in the library. So give us an example. Sure. Well, I'd like to show you, uh, um, I have a little bit of a slideshow that goes along with this. So on slide one, I want to show you a recent math collaboration we did with our eighth grade math team. And this is a shot from this. We use the Sphero robots, and I've got one here. And what we did with this, the students had just finished their study of angles and the Pythagorean theorem. And so we really wanted to push and extend their learning. So we created these boards that you can see the side of kind of on the bottom right of the screen there. And we called our activity Dragon Ball Z versus the Pythagorean theorem. So we took a popular anime character to, to make it more relevant for our students. And they had to code that robot. You can see the girl on the right-hand side, or on, in the middle of the screen rather, has her, her uh, phone out and she's coding that robot to move through the maze. And so they had to do angle calculations and they were really trying to answer the inquiry question about what's the best way to make the robot move through the maze. The maze has a Z shape in it and also several angles. And they had to apply the knowledge of the Pythagorean theorem and angles to that. And one thing they ran into is they kind of assumed that it had to go very, very fast, but they really had to work on getting it to stop in different places and then turn and go through a series of turns to apply that knowledge. And you see the, the one thing that there was a, something they had to really learn to use was if you can see the circle that's in the other girl's hands there, that's actually a protractor and it's a special protractor. So they had to continue to build their knowledge by using that protractor to measure their angles with the Sphero robot. And the last step, and this is my favorite part, because after they had programmed it to code through this maze on this giant on this giant poster board, it's one of those science boards that they use for science fair projects sometimes that we had spread out. They had to get it to stop. We called it stop on a dime. And so we had a spot where they had to, after they had coded it to move through at different speeds and angles to make it through the triangles and the Z shape, they had to make it stop on a very specific spot at the end of a tunnel. 
And so it was, it was a really challenging learning activity and, and really a highly engaging learning activity. And I loved it too, because math sometimes is an area that is a, is a little bit of a challenge for librarians to collaborate with. You know, sometimes there's natural connections in some of the more text-based contents, but that was, that, this was one that we had done recently. I do have another one I could show too um, on, on the slide too there. This is probably my favorite project since we've been at Lakeside. And that's saying something because we do lots of crazy projects all the time. But this is one we've done for several years. This is our invention literacy project with our eighth grade social studies teachers. And the inquiry question that they were trying to solve or trying to come up with the answer for was how to do, how, how is it possible to recreate an invention using modern tools? They were studying about the progressive era at the time after the Civil War when a lot of really great inventions like the elevator and the, uh, and the airplane and the, and the car were coming about. And they were, they were tasked to research a problem or research a past invention and then recreate or develop a solution for it. So in this picture, you can see that this particular student chose to recreate a Morse code machine. So if you can see the two micro bits of those microcontrollers in his hands, he's connected those and coded those so that, micro, so that they, the micro bit will transmit Morse code from one micro bit to the other. And they did some other, the kid, every year the students just come up with amazing projects. You know, they come up with a problem so they've got some ownership that they, they choose the problem. It's not assigned to them. Um, this past year, we had a lot of students who really wanted to focus on water filtration. So they developed water filtration systems. You know, that was an issue with the cities and city water in the, in the late 1800s. And they worked to develop filtration systems that worked. Um, my, probably my favorite project that anybody has ever done with this one was the problem that students identified was that a lot of a lot of children were working in factories and so they didn't have a chance to get educated and learn things like their numbers and their letters so one of the things that they did is they actually developed a cookie counter game for students so when they got home from work they had a they had a made up fire that they had coded and then they had a counter where kids could count the cookies as they came out of the oven to teach them how to how to count because they were too busy doing their job in the factory to learn some of those basic skills in that time it was a really great way. And this is, we actually did a, we did a Google Hangout with a class um, with a friend of mine named Stoney Evans in, in uh, Southern Arkansas. And we shared inventions across the internet with them. I don't know if you can see it on the right-hand screen, but they, they would share their inventions. We would share their, their, our inventions as well. That's so absolutely we're... incredible. So, uh, <clears throat> but I also understand that you've done a, dis your doctoral dissertation was right down this kind of uh, a topical area. Tell us about that. Sure, I'd be I'd be glad to. Um, my my dissertation I wrote it through the University of Memphis IDT program, Instructional Design and Technology, and that's that's what my degree is in. Because I I mean it's it, I'm that's 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 who I am. I love tech the way technology and instruction come together to create amazing learning opportunities for all of our learners. And my my dissertation itself focused on teacher perceptions of barriers to teaching information literacy, or we might say inquiry, or you know, library land we call it research skills in poverty settings. So I interviewed teachers around the state and I wanted to use this. I, I've been able to use this in my practice in the library just to inform my instructional practice and to, to really broaden the opportunities for inquiry for our learners. Um, one thing that I found in my study is that, uh, you know, one of the things that students don't have, I've got an announcement about to come over the intercom here. So I may have to hit pause for a second. So one example of the direct application of what I learned about the barriers that teachers had identified was that a lot of our students lack the background knowledge that they need to successfully conduct research or to do inquiry. So as you can see on slide three, I, I worked on a, a unit with my ninth grade English teachers. And one of the skills we, we learned that students need, need to develop that background knowledge is they need to learn how to ask their own questions. And so they were studying about the Shakespearean era and this is, this is TV number five. There's actually seven TVs in the Lakeside Library. And each one had a very general topic like religion or recreation or relationships. And there was a little piece of text, as you can see in the middle there. And students would read that with their groups. And then they would develop questions based on what they read to just uh, to help them develop that background knowledge. Also, to really power their inquiry. I mean, it was, it was very much an empowering experience for our learners to not have their questions handed to them, like, go find these things. And so it was, I want to know that, you know, and as you can see, if you can see the little dots that are on the screen there, the next step in this lesson, after they've gone around and visited the seven different stations and practice this skill <laughs> of opening their own questions, 
they they went back and they voted with their with those little stickers to say, I think this group has the best question. And we also told them it was okay to borrow somebody else's question if they found one that they really liked. So it also, they were learning from each other and just generating that background knowledge to really help them to be empowered to do that inquiry. Um, one thing that I liked about this activity too that we learned was just sometimes there are questions that don't have answers. And I think that was one of the key learnings of our students too, that you may ask a bunch of questions, but there may be one that there really isn't an answer for that one yet. Uh, Cause I think that's an important component of inquiry that might sometimes get, get overlooked. Um, another thing just that came out of my dissertation is that we're really taking a school-wide approach to inquiry. Yeah, I mentioned with that ninth grade English class, but I work with all of my teachers on inquiry projects throughout the year. You know, the one thing that research has told us is that oftentimes inquiry lessons or research is, it's, you see the library one time in the year for the research unit, and that's it. And that's not a best practice to teach our kids to build and, and really have sustainable inquiry skills. So we visit, we visit frequently. I will visit with classes several times during the year to continue. We start with some of the basics in the first term of the year and move through the year to continue to build those skills and continue to build those inquiry, inquiry based opportunities. And we're really, we've moved past that one shot, hey, see the library in one time approach. And really it's become more of a school wide, school wide thing. That's absolutely incredible. So uh, what, what difference does all this make in, in this whole idea of equity that's going on, you know, that we're so many of us are worried about because of the diversity in so many classrooms across the nation. Well, I'm I'm convinced, Dr. Lurcher, that that inquiry learning or the, the ability to have inquiry skills to find information, I really believe that that's one of the that may be the most important 21st century skill for our students to leave their educational experience with. And so um, to that, to that end, you know, in, and just to share another piece from the research that I did, um, there was a study done in 2020 that talked about, and it looked, it looked at the history of inquiry instruction. And what that study found is that often inquiry at really high level, um, high interest, engaging inquiry learning was only offered to certain groups of students. Uh -huh. And it, it tended to be, oh, well, that's for the advanced yeah, that, that's, for, that's for this group of students, but not for everybody else. And they, they referred to in that study, it's Otbright, Leftwich, and Ertmer 2020. It was, they referred to them as, as the group that got left out was the linguistically and culturally diverse students. And so when I read that, and when, I, when I'm seeking to apply my setting to produce equities, I want all my learners to have access to those kinds of opportunities. And I provide those not only in the formal classroom instruction, but also in some of the informal ways. And I'll get into that here in just a second. But you know, that, that's a big part of equity is providing these opportunities for the critical thinking skills and the research skills that are so embedded in inquiry-based learning. That's something I'm really passionate about. This is a way that libraries can really help to level the playing field for our learners to make sure that all of our students, you know, not to look at you know, our linguistic or cultural diversity as some kind of a barrier, but to look at, as, you know, the, the study actually refers to those as funds of knowledge that we can tap into to promote inquiry-based learning and promote high levels of thinking. And that's 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 a way that I seek to bridge that that equity gap on a daily basis. And so so many schools would would like to duplicate what you're doing because it's so impressive. So how does this happen? How, do, how does it come about? Well, one of the ways that I do that, and it's, it's shown on slides four, five, and six, is we, I also, I, I mentioned some of those more structured classroom activities. We also do a lot of, of informal inquiry. So we have a makerspace program here. We have an enrichment period that meets several days a week. And all the students in my building, all 700, have the option to sign up for these sessions. So this is actually a scene, and the inquiry question this, this is just, inquiry, inquiry doesn't have to be formal. So if I wanted to start something like this in a school, if I saw this video, or if I saw some of these opportunities, I thought, I want my students in my building to have these. I would say start with some informal opportunities like this, maybe before school or if you have an enrichment period and invite students to come in. This one that's on the screen is from our book club. We read a, we have a, what's called the Lakeside Book Club or the LBC. And we meet on Fridays and we, we, we read current YA novels. And we usually, we always have, we often, let me try this again. We have opportunities to, to give students to help build their background knowledge. We actually invite guest speakers in before we read the book to help them have some background in it. Like the novel that we read for the, with this activity was, was called Rebel Spy. And it's by Veronica Rossi, and it's a book about the Culper spy ring um, from 
that Washington used to help win the Revolutionary War. And it's a fascinating story because the author took what little we know about a woman named who was only known by her number, 355. And they she was a part of the spy network. And this, this author wrote kind of the other 99% of the story. So we read that book, but we met with an expert who kind of questioned whether she existed. We had a Zoom call with him first. And then we would read and discuss the book over the course of several weeks. And we did we meet with the author on, uh, on a Zoom call. But we did this invisible ink activity. And, th and this is just informal inquiry. This is really fun. As you can see, there's there's four different, there's actually, if you, you can see the girls painting on there. We use four different formulas with, with the question being, what's the best formula for invisible ink? And the yellow one is turmeric and we had also milk and we had, I'm trying to remember what the other, the other two are escaping me in my brain at this moment, but they got to go test this out. We weren't having them write an essay, but we were just having, here's the question, let's go figure this out. And the students loved it. Um, and you can see actually the one that's turmeric, that's the kind of yellow one with the red, kind of the red reaction on there, down the middle pieces there. Those, that was actually the best the best one. But this this would be one example of informal inquiry that we do. And again, this is, this is you know, in terms of equity, this is, this is something that's open to all of our students. Um, I also connect my campus with, just to build background knowledge, with guest speakers, not just for book club, but we've met with the chief statistician from ESPN with all of our ninth grade math students before to talk about what are real world applications of statistics? Or we met with a, a, a woman who was a, a descendant of John Ross who led the Cherokee March during the Trail of Tears last year to really connect my learners. Because a lot of my kids have not been out of the state of Arkansas. And so I can't fly them other places, but I can connect them with experts. And um, we also did one with some driverless car companies. We had two different companies come in via Zoom and talk to us about the ethical implications of that. Um, at one time. That's another way that we connect. A couple other quick examples of informal inquiry on like on slide five. Um, we also try and collaborate with our teachers in the makerspace. So this is this is a what's called a homopular circuit. And this was an extension we did in that enrichment period. We did this with our eighth grade science students who had just learned about non-contact forces like magnetism. So in this, the inquiry question was, what's the best way to take a piece of copper wire given a battery? That's kind of the, the coin looking thing on the bottom or the, mag the magnets, the coin looking thing and the battery, and then that'll create a magnetic field. And what's the best way to make that piece of wire spin as fast as you can? And so the kids absolutely love this. And we had all kinds of designs or kind of swivels. You can see this one, I think is supposed to look like a heart, but it's, it's just informal ways to get kids, kids to deepen their thinking by going and testing things out, asking questions and building that questioning um, to create some really wonderful learning experiences. There's one other example, and some of, this is one that's not really content related, on slide six. And this is one that I, this is probably my favorite and it's really cheap. If you have some textbooks and some paper and some tape, the key question here is, is it possible if you're given one piece of tape and one piece of paper to hold up a big old heavy textbook? And I love what these girls did with this. They ran with it. You can see they've actually got two textbooks worth of, worth of, of pillars built. This is kind of the Greek pillar concept. And it's great because we've actually built these over people's heads. We've built these over three feet high before. And um, we have to get out a yardstick or even have the measuring tape to measure these. But it's just these little informal inquiry things are really a good, a good place to start. You know, I think that I think that to, more to going back to answering your question just about if schools want to start this, we've got to support our libraries, both with funding and also resources. And also we've got to be able to kind of reframe them. You know, there's this idea that's, that some people have, and I think sometimes growing up, I had this perception too, that the library is this quiet place that's full of books. And libraries are so much more than that. And they offer so much more for enrichment and experiences for our, for our learners. You know, sometimes they're, they're noisy. Sometimes they're chaotic. It's loud. You know, Dr. Lurcher, I've never actually shushed anybody in my library because oftentimes that's when learning happens is those interactions with our peers and developing that understanding, kind of like what we've seen in some of the photos today. You know, I really think that the library is, we are the ideal place um, for all of our learners to have access to high quality inquiry-based learning activities. You know, we're the perfect place for that. Exactly. So we think of the bottom line of, of all of this. What, what is that? What's the main message? I really, I really believe, Dr. Lurcher, that the bottom line is that libraries and librarians can play a really key role in supporting inquiry-based learning through collaboration with teachers. You know, librarians are essential for collaboration to be collaborative partners to extend learning, to infuse it with technology, 
to provide these engaging learning opportunities that are going to captivate our kids and help propel them to success in the 21st century. I really think we're, as a librarian, that, that our field, we are essential to provide equitable access to materials and also those inquiry-based learning opportunities for, for all of our learners, not just some of them, but for everyone. We're a real key to everyone being successful and moving forward. That is a wonderful message. Thank you, uh, Dr. Johnson, for uh, an incredible uh, uh, visit to your uh, library environment across the school. Thank you, thank you so very much for your contribution. Thank you, thank you for the opportunity. Bye-bye. <laughs>